Hi, I'm John Stevenson, and we're going to be looking at the Diadochoi in our continuing study of the period between the Testaments. We left off last time with the death of Alexander the Great, who, as he left on his deathbed, was asked by his generals, to whom are you going to leave your kingdom? And he whispered out to the strongest, and that meant it was going to be a fight to see who would succeed him. Now, that term, the Diadochoi, it means the successors. These are the immediate successors, the next generation of generals after Alexander. So that's what we're going to be looking at uh, this time. The first of those is Ptolemy. He's known as Ptolemy Soter. That means Ptolemy the Savior. I'm not sure everybody uh, recognized him with that name, but that's the that's the name that stuck. Uh, I'm going to refer to him as Ptolemy or Ptolemy the First. There's all of his descendants are also going to be named Ptolemy, and he was one of the generals uh, to Alexander. Might have actually been related to him, and he took Egypt um, not as his personal possession, but he says I'm only holding it for the heir of Alexander. When he comes along, he'll get it. But so so I'm. Uh, sort of a regent uh, watching over Egypt. This, this is the stance he's going to take here at this time. Later on, he's going to change. Um, and he takes the body of Alexander to the city of Alexandria in Egypt. Now, there were a number of different cities called Alexandria, uh, but the best known, the best known uh, Alexandria is the one that's still there. If you go to Egypt today, the second largest city in all of Egypt today is the port side city, Um, of Alexandria. Uh, It's still a major metropolis even today, and it had been planted there by Alexander. Now, Perdiccas, one of the generals, had been moving the body of Alexander, uh, seeing that it was going to be taken back to Macedonia. After all, Alexander was from Macedon. Uh, But now when Ptolemy uh, grabs the, the body, Perdiccas comes against him to attack. They're actually going to fight over the body of Alexander, uh, and Perdiccas loses. And so, uh, of those Diadochoi, of, the, of those successors, Perdiccas is going to be the, the most short-lived one. And Ptolemy takes the body of Alexander to Alexandria and builds a giant mausoleum there, a, a giant tomb uh, that would house the body. And the, t- the body of Alexander would be on display for many hundreds of years um, to follow. Uh, when Julius Caesar comes to Alexandria, he's going to go into the tomb and he's going to look at the body of Alexander. Uh, of course, remember the, the Egyptians, they're able to uh, mummify. They had these, uh, and even though Ptolemy is Greek, he's ruling over Egypt and the Egyptians over which he's ruling know how to do that sort of thing. Now, Seleucus was, had been one of the generals under Ptolemy. And um, in that fight with Perdiccas, Seleucus is sent to sort of uh, take over and watch over Mesopotamia, and and he does, uh, as well as Syria. Meanwhile, Olympias, and you remember she was the mother of Alexander the Great. He he was only 33 years old when he died, so she's still alive. She's very much a player. And she plots the murder of the half-brother of Alexander, not, not her own son, uh, but uh, another of Philip's sons, half-brother to Alexander, and, and uh, because he could be a potential rival uh, to her and to Alexander's uh, infant son that had been born. Remember, Alexander, when he died, he had no children, but his wife was pregnant, his wife, Roxana. And so uh, she tries to set herself up as the regent for her grandson, where she's going to, remember, Ptolemy is sort of doing the same thing in Egypt, but but the grandson isn't in, in Egypt. And so she's in Macedon, and she's trying to set it up where she has sort of a controlling interest. And she is murdered by Cassander. We're going to look at him in a second. He's one of those Diodokle. He's one of those uh, surviving generals. And he takes over as the region of Macedon. Um, and eventually, Roxana and the child are murdered. So there's no, not going to be any, sex, any successors of Alexander who were descended of him. Uh, they're, all, they're all put to death. So you have Cassander that's ruling Macedon. You have Lysimachus who is ruling Thrace. You have Ptolemy. We already mentioned he's in Egypt. We had Seleucus, but he's, re- he's really there in Mesopotamia as a uh, representative uh, representing Sol- Ptolemy's interests, at least right now. Um, and then there is also Antigonus. He's known as Antigonus the One-Eyed. He'd lost a, an eye in battle. 
Um, the father of Alexander had lost an eye in battle. You have to, you know, watch out for your eyes when you're in battle. Uh, Antigonus the one-eyed, uh, and they all team up against him. Uh, so Cassandra, Lysimachus, and Ptolemy, all, and Seleucus too, for that matter. Uh, and Antigonus uh, is, you know, he dies in battle. Now he's going to have some, uh, a son and a grandson that continue. So that's not the end of his line, but but he's out. Um, and then in the in the um, in the post war, uh, the post you know battle struggle. Now we have Seleucus who sets himself up, and Ptolemy I don't think really intended that, but Seleucus sets himself up and plants a city, and names it after his father uh, was named Antiochus. And we're going to see a number of, of people af, of, of Seleucus's children, which will be named, not all of them will, but a number of them will be named Antiochus. And so we have the city of Antioch. Now that's going to become a major city, you know, right up there with Alexandria. Uh, and in the New Testament period, remember the, the Christians were first, uh, the believers, the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. This is the Antioch oh, that's being spoken of there in Acts chapter 11, where we, we read of that. It's still a major city even today. So Alexandria is a major city even today. And Antioch, uh, the, 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 the way they pronounce it is a little bit different. You can still recognize it. And it's still a, a major city in Syria today. Now, little tiny Judah is in the middle. And with the fall of Antigonus the one-eyed, and uh, Seleucus taking uh, there in the north, Ptolemy grabs Judah. And when I say he grabs it, um, I think it's rather violently. Here's the description that Josephus gives us in his Antiquities. He said, Ptolemy seized upon Jerusalem and for that end made use of deceit and treachery, for as he came into the city on a Sabbath day, as if he would offer sacrifices, he, without any trouble, gained the city while the Jews did not oppose him, for they did not suspect him to be their enemy. And he gained it thus, because they were free from su suspicion of him. Remember, uh, Alexander had, had let them worship the way they wanted. But Ptolemy comes in, and because on that day they were at rest and quietness, and when he had gained it, he ruled over it in a cruel manner. Now, Josephus doesn't say this, but um, there's an indication from later comments that when Ptolemy grabs Jerusalem, that there is some major damage done to the walls of Jerusalem. Remember how the walls had been rebuilt in the days of Nehemiah? Um, well, I'm not saying they're all torn down, um, but there's some, some damage, some major damage to the fortifications and maybe even to the temple. I'm not so sure about that. Um, but there's later references that make it seem that it, there was some damage there. And you say, where did that come, come about? It seems to have come about here. But we don't have any clear records telling us about it, only that later on it was damaged. Now, Ptolemy I, Ptolemy the Savior, as he calls himself, um, he, at Alexandria, he builds what's called the Pharos Lighthouse. Uh, and this is uh, considered to be one of the wonders of the ancient world of that period, uh, a lighthouse where you could see the light shining out across the sea some 50 miles uh, away. Uh, he also eventually begins to develop, maybe from having captured Jerusalem, maybe he brings some of them back as slaves, I'm not sure uh, of the status, but a large Jewish community now begins to uh, find its way into Alexandria. I think this is where he captures Jerusalem, brings back some as slaves, but eventually some of them are released. Maybe all of them are eventually released, uh, maybe purchased by their own uh, Jewish brothers. Um, you know, he's willing to, he's willing to sell slaves. Um, be that as it may, you now begin to have a large Jewish community there in the city of Alexandria. And that's going to continue for many hundreds of years, uh, even to the New Testament period and beyond. Um, so these had started off as captives, um, but then on the heels of that, we begin to see some people immigrating down to Alexandria. Um, in the Persian period, you'd had a, a Jewish uh, garrison all the way uh, far to the south in southern Egypt on the Nile River. Um, but this, this uh, now is all within Alexandria. Um, he also builds a library at Alexandria. There's still a library of Alexandria even today. Uh, 
course, it's modern today, um, and I've uh, I've been in there. Paula, my wife, is a librarian, and so she got a chance to meet the library director of the Library of Alexandria. That was, that was a great thing. But this was going to be the biggest library in the world. Uh, not just a library, but a center of learning, a school dedicated to the muses. In fact, we have the term museum um, from this very idea of such a school that's uh, all about learning and science and discovery and things like that. Now, this library at Alexandria, um, the goal that, um, that Ptolemy has is to have every book in the world. Now, remember, they don't have the printing press, and so they're not just printing books out, but uh, books are hand-copied. And uh, what they would do is they would search any ship coming into the harbor, and Alexandria is going to become the major harbor in the entire eastern part of the Mediterranean. And ships coming into the, uh, into the port are going to be searched, not for drugs, but for books, for and, uh, any, any manuscripts, um, and any that are found are going to be confiscated and taken to the library and copied. And then they're going to give the copy back to the ship. You know, you, you, we, we don't want to steal all your books. But we're keeping the original because that's probably uh, has less errors. And, you know, anytime you copy something, there's always the potential for having uh, errors that creep into the text. Uh, much later, 100 years later, we're going to see a, another library, a competing library, a rival library at the city of, Caper, uh, of Pergamum. And Pergamum, uh, it's, it's inland. It's uh, they, their Acropolis is on a big mountain. We'll talk about this perhaps in the future. Uh, it's a, a wonderful library, not quite as big as Alexandria, but they were giving them a run for their money, also seeking to get copies of, of all the books. And uh, there was a little competition that's going to develop eventually between these two libraries. Um, and the way that will play out is that uh, Ptolemy, the Ptolemies, it won't be Ptolemy the first anymore, but the Egyptians are going to put an embargo on papyrus. Now, papyrus is a plant that's used to make what passed back then for paper. Uh, you had other sources of writing. You could you could write on animal skins. Uh, that was actually quite a bit more expensive because you have to buy the animal and then kill the animal and take uh, its skin. Um, but papyri, uh, this plant that grows only in the Nile Delta, and <laughs> Egypt said, uh, for a time at least, uh, we're not going to let any, any of that out of Egypt. Now, that's not going to continue indefinitely, so that when we get to the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, of a later era, we will find mostly uh, parchment, mostly animal skins, but there will be a few pieces of papyri uh, that are found uh, in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, in their quest for a copy of every book in the world, uh, it's noted that the Jewish people have a series of books uh, that they call the Scriptures, uh, the Hebrew Scriptures, of uh, 22 books. And you say, wait a minute, I thought that the uh, there were 39 books in the Old Testament. Uh, well, that's the way we count them. Uh, they counted, it's the same books, but they counted them differently. Uh, they looked at the, for example, the Minor Prophets, they counted that as one book, they called it the Twelve. And uh, books like Ezra and Nehemiah, they counted that as one book. Uh, you know, how you have First and Second Samuel, First, Second Kings, First, Second Chronicles. Uh, those were counted as one book instead of First and Second. Uh, so, twenty-two books, and um, by this time, Ptolemy the Second, the son of Ptolemy the uh, First, he's known as Ptolemy Philadelphus. So we'll mention this later on, but uh, um, you know how that means the city of brotherly love, Philadelphia. Um, he got that nickname because he had followed the Egyptian custom, uh, how the ancient pharaohs had married their sister to keep everything uh, in-house. Uh, he wasn't interested in doing anything with his sister. That would be strange. Uh, but just for the sake of appearances, he legally married his sister. And so he got this nickname of Ptolemy Philadelphus. Um, and he extends the Library of Alexandria. And he says, I want that book or a series of books, those Jewish books, translated from, from Hebrew. I can't read Hebrew. Uh, I want them translated. Now, he doesn't have them translated into Egyptian because he couldn't read, read Egyptian either. In fact, none of the Ptolemies, uh, Ptolemy I, uh, nor his son, nor any of his children, all the way down to the very last Ptolemy, uh, none of them can read Hebrew. There will be a Ptolemy, a, a descendant, by the name of Cleopatra that will learn how to, to read Egyptian uh, hieroglyphs. But 
uh, but these can't. And so they, they just read Greek and you, they speak Greek. And if you want to speak to them, even though they're ruling over Egypt, you better learn Greek. So the, the order now is to take the Hebrew scriptures and translate them into Greek. And for the translators, uh, the story goes that they select six men from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. You say 12 tribes, weren't the 10 tribes lost? No, uh, they knew who they were. They knew where they were, even though they no longer have their their tribal land possession. You know, they don't live, you know, where where the tribal units uh, said they lived back in the days of the uh, of the monarchy. Uh, they don't have that anymore, but they still know what tribes are, they're coming from. So six men from each of the 12 tribes of Israel, uh, the six times 12, that's 72 translators. And because of that, Septus is the word 70. And so that's where we get the name Septuagint. It, it re- refers to the 70. They round it off. It's actually 72 translators that we're going to work on this translation. And so sometimes you'll see LXX, that's Roman numeral for 50, 60, 70. Um, and that's, that's shorthand for instead of writing out the whole word Septuagint. So you'll see that sometimes in your textbook, uh, in other books. Uh, Don't let that throw you. Now, the Septuagint contains a number of extended readings um, where where things, I I suspect, uh, there's a few things that got added along the way, or maybe maybe our Hebrew text then got dropped along the way. Uh, that, that, that's possible, but I think it probably goes the other in the other direction. For example, there's a Psalm 151, an extra psalm. And when you read it, it's not a terrible psalm, but when you read it, I think you can just tell that that's not really on, of the same quality. It's, you know, um, I don't want to be mean, but I, I sort of feel like maybe a a uh, high school student, <laughs> yeah, or its equivalent, sort of penned that one. And it's not bad for a high school student, but it's not on the same level as the rest of the Psalms. Um, that's my opinion. Um, there's actually two of the Psalms in the Septuagint that are joined, where in the Hebrew text, they're separate Psalms. No, it's one right after the other, so they're not, uh, but they're, they're actually stuck together. Uh, early in the book of Psalms. And then there's another one much later toward the end of the Psalms where there's a psalm that was um, that was originally uh, one psalm and it's divided into two psalms in the Septuagint, uh, which means that if you're ever looking at your English Bible and then a Hebrew Bible and then a copy of the Septuagint or even something that has its chapters numbered according to the Septuagint, your chapters are going to be off by one chapter, and, and that can throw you. Uh, that can You say, what on earth happened there? Um, you know, I'm, I'm trying to translate that, and it doesn't say what it... Uh, um, they, they don't always match up. Uh, by the way, also, uh, when the Hebrew text, uh, they, when you have a superscription, you know, like it says the Psalm of David, uh, in the Hebrew text, that's considered verse 1. Now, the, the verse numbers weren't there yet, so that's added much, much later. Uh, But this is something that happens in the Septuagint. Uh, There are additions also to 1 Samuel and also to the book of Esther. Now, I'm not that familiar with the the ones in Esther. I've actually got uh, one of the professors that sometimes teaches at uh, South Florida Bible College, where I teach, uh, did her dissertation on the book of Esther. And uh, so she, she actually feels that there are some things that were inserted there that make the person of Esther a little harsher, and perhaps were even used in sort of a um, an anti-Semitic manner. Now that's her opinion, not mine. I I don't have I haven't studied enough to have an opinion. Uh, but for example, one of the one of the things in First Samuel, remember in um, I think it's First Samuel chapter eleven that talks about um, the king of uh, of um, not Moab but uh, Am, the king of Ammon who uh, comes up against the men of Jabesh Gilead, and um, he's going to capture them, and they say, well, we'll surrender. And he says, uh, fine, but I'm going to gouge out your right eye. Well, in the Septuagint, there's a few verses leading up to that that says he had captured other cities and had gouged out their right eye. Now, I don't know if he had really done that or not, uh, but the Septuagint tells that background story and, and maybe that's true. You, you know, uh, doesn't bother me either way. If it bothered the people, I'm sure. Uh, but there's those little sort of almost like editorial additions uh, in First Samuel. Um, Job and Jeremiah are actually smaller in the Septuagint text, where there's parts that are trimmed. You know, a little bit of editorial 
cutting out, you know, I don't know if it was repetition. I'm not sure why that took place. Uh, Job's wife is given further explanation where we have a little bit more to her story. And in, in the book of Job, Job's wife, she shows up just to, to make mention, you know, why don't you curse God and die? And you don't see her after that. There's more given to her story. Uh, again, was that somebody just wanting to give a, a further explanation? Uh, why did that take place? I'm not sure. Um, but the sense that most scholars have is that for the most part, and I think there might be the occasional exception to this, but for the most part, the Septuagint isn't quite as accurate, and I don't mean to be mean here, uh, as is the, the Hebrew text. Um, however, when the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered, one of the things that we found uh, are a few of the readings in the Septuagint that diverge from the Hebrew Masoretic text. Uh, we found Hebrew texts that followed the, followed the Septuagint. So not every single one of those divergencies are necessarily the result of a bad translation. Sometimes it's, it's because there was a different Hebrew text. And you say, well, which one's right? And I'm not going to play favorites. I'm just reporting you know, what is. Uh, now, eventually, the Apocrypha is going to be included, too, and will be translated, too. But that's, that's a couple hundred years later because the events of the Apocrypha hadn't even taken place yet. And it has to take place, and then somebody has to write it, and then it's going to be translated. So that, that's, that's way on down the road. That's, that's much further. Now, the Septuagint, the oldest copy, the, the Septuagint was the oldest copy uh, and I, I say copies, plural. There were, we had copies of the Septuagint that were the oldest copies that we had of the Old Testament prior to the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls in 1940. Well, 47, they were discovered. 48, they came to light. You know, scholars actually began to see them. But prior to, prior to then, um, if you wanted to see your very oldest copy of the Old Testament, you had to go look at the Septuagint. Um, the New Testament writers are going to use the Septuagint uh, the New Testament is written in Greek. Now, there's an old tradition that says Matthew uh, wrote his gospel in Hebrew, and then it was translated into, into Greek. If that's true, and I don't have a problem with it, if it is, but we don't have a Hebrew version of Matthew. Uh, so what Pat and, and all the other uh, rest of the New Testament was written in, uh, in Greek, um, usually with a Greek audience in mind, so that, that makes all sorts of sense. Uh, but even there, there were even Jewish people uh, around the ancient world, by the time you get to the New Testament period, uh, who could no longer read and write and speak in Hebrew, um, especially those who no longer lived in the land. They lived in other places. But even even in Jerusalem, there were those, remember the, the issue with the deacons and feeding the, the Hebrew-speaking widows versus the Greek-speaking widows? There were Christians, Christian Jewish people, um, they were Jewish, but they, they couldn't speak Hebrew any longer. <laughs> they, it had become a lost language, and they were, they were speaking Greek instead. Uh, so the new, you can see why the New Testament writers would use this translation. And this would become, then, the standard Bible of the church, which would be why so many copies uh, that would be made uh, by Christians copying the Septuagint. Uh, and it's going to be the regular Bible used by the, by the early church, and uh, all, as long as Greek tends to... Uh, uh, is used. And actually, the, the church in the East, uh, many of them still uh, read and use Greek as their, as their Bible. Uh, the Eastern Orthodox Church does that even today. Now, back to our history. We you know, took a bit of a side road looking at the Septuagint. <clears throat> we had Cassander and Lysimachus. Remember, Seleucus has, has uh, built the city of Antioch. Um, but Cassander, he has two sons, Alexander and Antipater. And when he dies, they are at odds with each other. They try to, uh, each one's trying to overcome the other. You know, there's no brotherly love here. And uh, they, they sort of cancel each other out. And now Demetrius, he's the son of, of Antigonus, the one-eyed. Remember the one uh, that they all ganged up on? Uh, well, he's going to come on the scene. Uh, and so to combat this, you have Ptolemy I, who has uh, several children, three children, three uh, children. Uh, two were, he probably has others too, but we're just looking at the key ones. Ptolemy II is not the oldest, but he's going to be the successor. And there is also Ptolemy uh, Caranus, uh, Ptolemy Thunderbolt uh, is, is what the, the term means. Um, and then 
uh, Ptolemy has a daughter by the name Ar- Arsenio, and he wants to form an alliance with Lysimachus. He, you know, he, the way you get power is by making alliances. And so he has Lysimachus marry Arsenio. Uh, and meanwhile, to the west, I haven't talked about Pyrrhus at all, uh, there is a king of uh, of uh, a Pyrrhus by the name of Pyrrhus. The, the name sort of matched there. I'm not sure if that was intentional. Uh, and Lysimachus and Pyrrhus uh, get together and they come up against Demetrius and drive him away. Um, and the idea is they're going to split the you know, Macedonia between them. But frankly, Pyrrhus isn't that interested. So he's just going to go home. Uh, he's going to get into other problems eventually, but that's not yet. So Lysimachus now is going to be over Thrace and Macedonia. So Lysimachus uh, turned out as the big winner here. But Ptolemy did too, because he's got his son-in-law now ruling that area, and he's got that family connection, and he's made his position that much more uh, solid. Now, Lysimachus already had a son. He marries Asenio, but he's already got a son, uh, Ag- uh, Agathocles. Um, and uh, Lys- again, there's going to be another family connection where another daughter of Ptolemy uh, will uh, be married off Lysandra will be married off to the son. So we're getting those family connections where even if someone dies, we're still family. Um, and Ptolemy is the one orchestrating this to make sure that he's got an in with whoever's in power up there in Macedonia. Um, now, after Lysimachus and Arsenio marry, they have two sons. Uh, and there's an issue. Who's going to rule? Is it going to be their two sons? Arsen- that's what Arsenio wants. Or is it going to be the son of Lysimachus, Agathocles? Um, Is he going to, you know, who's going to run out? And we have some family dynamic problems that are coming to the coming to the front. Now, Ptolemy uh, Caranus, as I said, uh, he's the oldest, but he has a falling out with dad, and so instead he leaves home and he goes and aligns himself with Seleucus. Um, and, and Seleucus and Ptolemy, uh, they're not fighting, but they're not friendly either. There, there's some competition, and you can tell that you know, war, is, war is ahead. It's, it's, it's coming up. And so Ptolemy went over to the enemy of his father, uh, to Seleucus, and uh, uh, our, our, the son of Lysimachus dies. Uh, I think maybe there was some foul play, uh, someone wanting her two sons to be in charge instead. Uh, and Lysandra, now that she's been widowed, she also goes to Seleucus to link up with her brother Ptolemy. Um, the sort of brother and sister are going to be both in the camp of Seleucus because you know, otherwise they're left out in the cold. And Seleucus now goes up, invades Macedon, and takes out Lysimachus. <laughs> so n- notice Seleucus is the one who's, who's turning into the big winner. And Ptolemy Caranus murders Lucas. You know, he, I, I went over there to help him out. And no sooner is he done what I want him to do, that now Seleucus murders, uh, is murdered by Ptolemy Caranus. And uh, Ptolemy Caranus now takes Macedon. And so notice what's happened between Ptolemy in Egypt, Ptolemy I, and Ptolemy Thunderbolt, Ptolemy Caranus. Um, they're not friendly together, even though they're father and son. Ptolemy Caranus, Ptolemy the Thunderbolt, now marries Arsenio II. Um, that's his his sister, or half-sister at least. Um, however, um, on their wedding day, uh, her two sons are murdered. Um, presumably, he's the one who arranged that. That's not going to endear her to him. And so she will leave him, go to Egypt, where she's going to marry another one of her brothers, Ptolemy II. This one's going to last. They will become not just a married couple, but they will become partners in ruling over Egypt. And she will be very influential in that regard. Uh, But meanwhile, Pyrrhus, remember Pyrrhus, the king of uh, Epirus uh, that had helped uh, Ptolemy actually had, had uh, that's right, had helped Ptolemy Caranus uh, capture this area of Macedon. Now, he's not interested in Macedon. Uh, he's king of Epirus, but he uh, gets into a fight across the, uh, 
the Adriatic in uh, on the on the Italian peninsula, and he finds himself fighting with uh, citizens of Rome, the, the city of Rome. There's no Roman Empire yet, um, but he finds himself fighting uh, Romans, and they fight a battle, and he wins the battle. He actually wins against the Romans, uh, but in that battle, he lost. He took a lot of casualties. Um, and, um, well, the Romans didn't go, uh, give up. They went and got another um, army together, and they came back and fought him again. And again, he won the victory. <laughs> and again, he took heavy casualties, which gives rise to that uh, expression when you read about a Pyrrhic victory. Uh, that's uh, It's being named after him. It's a victory that was very costly. It's a victory where, where yes, you won, but you lost so much in winning that it wasn't worth winning. And he is quoted after that second battle. He says, if I win one more battle, I'm going to lose the war. And sure enough, that happened. He continued fighting. The Romans came back with the third army and they wouldn't give up. And he fights him a third time. And this time he loses. And uh, he actually, that's the last we're going to hear of Pyrrhus. Uh, so he's not going to be a major uh, player anymore. And, and what is happening there in the West, we, we're not going to talk about that for a while. But Rome is a is a growing force in the West. They're, they're still just located in central Italy. So they're not a player here yet, but they will be. Now, we next have the Gauls come in and uh, Ptolemy Cronus, Ptolemy the Thunderbolt, gets thunderclapped as uh, this group of invaders from the north. Uh, think about, you know, Gaul, we usually think of France. And these are... Uh, they're just traveling through uh, both into Italy. They're traveling into the Balkans, and they you know they sweep over Macedon. They don't stop here. They're going to go all the way into Anatolia, and some of them will settle and give rise to the name. We're not going to see that name until we get to the New Testament. We're going to see a group of people called the Galatians. Well, <laughs> the word Galatians just means it's another way of saying the Gauls, the Gauls that have settled here in central Anatolia. And Antiochus I is able to get them to stop there. Um, Antiochus I, he, that's the son of Seleucus. So instead of Seleucus, we're now seeing Antiochus I, and we have Galatians that will be there in a few hundred years when the Apostle Paul comes to this part of the country and shares the gospel with them and will write an epistle to the Galatians. Uh, one of the early churches in this area. But we'll see that much further in the future.